All right, we're at 1031, so we'll go ahead and get started. Corey, we might have a couple people still get on. Would you mind taking over admitting people into the meeting for us? Sure thing. Okay, great. All right, so good morning, everyone. We have several people on here from Sunny Merriman that are going to be going through some commonly asked questions that our team receives. But as we said in the invitation for this meeting, this meeting is really about you guys and what you're interested in. So we're only going to spend a short portion of the first of the meeting going through again some commonly asked questions that we get um, just to kind of get the conversation started but it is definitely meant to be conversational so feel free to submit feedback or further questions in the chat you're also welcome to come off mute and interject as well this is definitely meant to be an open discussion forum and hopefully we have an hour for this meeting hopefully we get to everyone's questions but certainly if not i know at least some of us are able to stay on for longer or we can schedule some follow-up discussions as well. So with that, we will go ahead and get started and just do a couple brief introductions of people that we have on here from Sunny Merriman. I am Whitney Kapenko and I am our EV program manager. I'll pass it to Hello, and I'm Dean Farmer. I am Vice President for Sales and Marketing for Sunny Merriman. I certainly see a lot of old and familiar faces on the call today. Kayla, you want to go next? Sure. My name is Kaylee Edgley. I'm uh, the new president and CEO of Sunny Merriman. And uh, I, I look forward to like an hour of just discussions because this is new to everyone. It's not new to us as we've played with it for over a couple of years now, but we want to share our experience because it was totally new for us. And we had all these questions a couple of years ago. We want to share our experiences. No silly questions. So we look forward to you firing away. Thanks for coming on. Corey? Sure. So uh, I see, a, obviously, I see a lot of familiar faces on here. We've had a lot of discussion offline on phone calls and whatnot. So hopefully, you guys will get a lot out of this as we try to do this corporate and collaborative, collaboratively to try to pass on more information about EVs. But we're excited for you guys to definitely speak up and give us some questions. Good seeing everybody. Mike, Lloyd. Oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Mike Wirt, Eastern Regional Sales Manager. I look forward to a very communicative uh, meeting this morning. Let's get at it. And I'm Floyd Merriman. I'm now emeritus, so, uh, but I'm still hanging around watching everything. So good to see everybody. All right. Well, with that, we will go ahead and get started with our electric school bus one on one and Q&A session. I hear a little bit of an echo. Like I said, everyone is welcome to take off mute and speak. But if you're not, maybe just hit mute for the time being so we don't get an echo going on. But First question up to start us off with, can I charge the bus or an electric school bus in the rain? Who, let's see, how about Kaylee, you wanna take this one? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. And that's, uh, that's a good question, I think, to start the session with. Uh, we certainly have grown up and none of us would go outside in the rain with an extension cord and jump up and down in a mud puddle. We've been taught since we were very young not to do that, but the electric, bus is, is different it is okay to charge in in the rain uh, i had the experience last week of charging a bus i was at a place two hours i need to get extra charge so i could make it even longer uh, it was an ominous feeling with that big cable that carries 400 volts standing in the rain in a rain puddle but i knew the engineers designed it where there's no electricity flowing until it actually connects and there's like 10 seconds and it makes a handshake to make sure it's connected back to the charger, then the electricity starts flowing. But one does think about it when it's raining, you're plugging in with that big cable, but perfectly safe and designed and has multiple layers of safety so you can charge in the rain. You can plug in in the rain while standing in a mud puddle, even though it feels very awkward. Next question. What is the range of an electric school bus? Kaylee, I think you should share about this one since you've had the probably one of the longest trips in the bus. Yes, I did have to stop and charge in the rain because I was going 200 miles and I needed a charge in between. Um, 
every bus is different. Every electric vehicle, the range is different. So these facts and figures are for our bus. Uh, we have pretty good range because we have a 226 kilowatt battery on it. And that affords us a range of 138 miles on, on a single full charge. Uh, we're actually, there's a new style battery in our most recent buses where we're actually seeing more than that on a nice 72 degree day when we keep the window open, we don't run the air conditioner and we go over the flatlands. Uh, so those other factors do affect it and they will drive that range down. We're very confident in the 138 mile. I've experienced it myself. I've experienced 150 miles in, in one bus, but the ambient temperature was 72 degrees that day and I drove it nice and easy. Uh, and it wasn't that big terrain and I didn't have the air conditioner on. Uh, if you start to add all those factors in, what we've seen, especially in the winter time, heat uh, on the bus is the biggest dissipating factor. We could get into that 138 mile range and drive it down uh, by almost 18 to 19%. So you can start to see it get into the 115, 120 miles if you're really having to pump the heat. There's two other things uh, regarding range. One, I think we'll talk about a little bit more. You can extend that range with regenerative braking, uh, which is causing the bus to slow down, and actually pumps electricity back. We'll talk more about regenerative braking has, has a great effect on, on range. So we'll, we'll pay attention to that and those questions coming up, but uh, range, range is quite good. What we've seen from our customers so far, the 55 buses that have been commissioned, customers just don't push the range. They're able to put these buses on routes. They're not comfortable. They don't want to bump up to that 0% range or even 10% range. In most instances, we see 70, 80 miles being accumulated a day, and we never see the bus come back to the depot less than 30%, only in the rarest of instances when uh, they just want to extend it and get a few more miles. But most of our customers during the first year or two are only pushing it, the envelope to about 40%, then they're back at the depot charging on. Follow-up question to that in the chats here from Northampton. What is the low end of range on your buses? So I realize we don't really have a published low range per se, but Kaylee, what have we seen in terms of when you're considering some of these factors that impact range, perhaps some of the lowest instances of range. If you if you pack all of the worst conditions together, like we're we're having to um, pump all sorts of heat into the bus, we're going uphill the entire time. We've we're fully loaded. The low range that we've experienced is is 100 miles, but yet we don't we don't see customers pushing it that far. Um, they're getting comfortable by putting it on shorter routes, but 100 miles is certainly feasible on, on the worst range. And that's going to be a function of your battery size. You know, some, some other buses out there have smaller battery sizes. You can buy up if you want to spend all sorts of money and get into slightly larger battery sizes from our, some of our competitors. But it's a function of battery size. And that 138 seems to fit very well and get most if not all routes in sometimes two a day. So you only have to charge the bus once a day during the evening. One further follow up question on range. So from Brett here we have if you run out of charge during a trip, what do you do? So I would say, as Kaylee mentioned, I don't think that we have many that are quite pushing the envelope where they would run into a situation where they would have that happen. Um, but should they do push the envelope and the range is not quite what they expected or maybe the public charger wasn't available or whatever, what could they do if they ran out of charge? Anybody want to take that? Daily? Sure, uh, it's never happened. Um, I've done it on a test track before, uh, just pushing the envelope with the safety of people behind me to pick me up because we knew we were going to run it out. But what happens is the bus derates and goes very slow. It's a it's a forbidden secret to tell, but I'll tell it anyway. When it says 0%, it's really not at 0%. You save energy at 0% while well, there's still a little charge left in the battery and you start to derate so you can get to a safe place. So you're gonna lose your speed 
when you go from five to one percent to zero percent and get to a safe place and eventually it'll shut down um, but there's still more power at zero percent so you can get to that safe place okay northampton are when we quote our buses are referring to julie yes most of these questions we are referring to, of course, our specific um, experience with the Julie bus. However, a lot of this information I'm sure does translate to electric school buses in general. So, uh, Darlene, I see your question. Nancy, I see your question. Uh, we're going to get to those here shortly with another question. So I'll jump to our next popular question, which is how long does it take to charge an electric school bus? Um, I'll take this one. So it varies based on the charger that you're using. So certainly there are lots of different chargers available for electric school buses. Speaking of ours specifically, we have several listed on state contract. Two of the most popular that we've seen with our electric buses are one, a 25 kilowatt DC fast DC charger that's a Delta brand charger. On that charger, if you were to totally drain Julie out and had to do a full charge, it would take about eight hours. Um, a lot of our customers have a 60 kilowatt DC fast charger, and with that one, it takes about three hours to fully charge Julie. Now, of course, most instances of people charging their buses, it's probably not going to be at that zero percent. So it's probably not even going to take as long as three to eight hours to get a charge because you won't be drained or charging from a fully drained battery, if you will. But um, one question that we got here is. Um, from Nancy, are the charging stations universal or pr proprietary? If we travel outside of your cal locality, say to a city area, will we be able to utilize public charging stations on the buses? So our team has driven uh, several of the Julie buses across the state and has had the opportunity to use a couple public chargers. Uh, I know Kaylee just used one at a Sheets recently. We've also used one in a shopping center. I believe the brand was Electrify America. So yes, there, it is possible that you can charge a Julie bus on public charging stations. What becomes more of an issue with using public charging stations is will they accommodate an actual full-size school bus? That's been some of our experience with looking at public chargers is they're not the easiest to maneuver with a full-size school bus. But getting into that, so if you were to say go to a public charger, for instance, the one that we went to, we pulled up to an Electrify America charger that was a 150 kilowatt charger. Now, as I mentioned, we have a 25 and a 60 kilowatt charger. So in theory, when you're trying to calculate how long would it have taken us to charge our bus? Well, if we needed to fully charge it, um, say 200 kilowatt hours and it's 150 kilowatt charger, well, it shouldn't take but what, maybe an hour or so, depending on how much we needed to charge it. But the caveat to that is you have to know what your bus is willing to accept. So even though it's a 150 kilowatt charger, the bus has limitations as to what type or how strong of an energy it can take. So on a Julie Electric school bus, that looks about like 90 kilowatts total. So even though it's a 150 kilowatt charger, it's only going to be able to accept a rate of 90 kilowatts. So it still wouldn't charge it quite as fast as what you would calculate using this formula, if that makes sense. Okay. What is the cost of an electric school bus? Dean, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, is anybody who's been to the grocery store recently knows uh, trying to determine the price of a can of soup can be difficult these days? And uh, certainly buses are no different. But to uh, put a number on this question, the average price of a current Julie Electric school bus on the Virginia state contract is approximately $375,000. And of course, that's going to depend on each locality and your option content on the bus that could go up or go down. Currently, we have more than 50 Julie Electric School buses on Virginia highways these days, and none of those cost anywhere near $375,000 because since those have been put into service, of course, we've seen inflation and price escalation in everything, uh, particularly the price of batteries has gone up significantly in the past six months. And of course, with growing demand for electric school buses, we're seeing some, uh, some inflation there as well. Of course, we don't expect any locality to have uh, a kitty fund of $375,000 to fork out for an electric school bus. And you're going to be dependent upon grants, funding, and other uh, creative financing uh, avenues you know, to acquire buses. And we're going to talk about some of those programs uh, a bit later on in this presentation. But again, 
if you're looking for kind of a base figure for a new electric school bus, $375,000 in Virginia. All right, another popular question. What training is available for drivers, technicians, and first responders? Um, how about, Corey, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, as everybody probably knows, you know, we do a pretty good job of of training our customers. And, um, you know, Daniel D Drew has done a lot of training throughout the state. And I'm pretty sure everybody on the call is familiar with him. But we do a hands on <clears throat> classroom style training um, provided to the technicians, drivers and first responders. And I've been personally involved with all these classes. So there's different levels. HV1 training is for the drivers and the technicians are involved in that training as well. But obviously it gives them the driver everything they need to know about that vehicle in order to operate it safely and charge it. And then the HV, the HV2 training provides um, detailed training, more detailed training to the technicians um, and, and allows them the understanding of how the high voltage system works and um, the, 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 uh, the components and items they can work on on the low voltage side and then the familiar things like brakes and, and, and such that they normally work on as well. And, um, and then we will have a HV3 training coming soon, which allows the technician to commission and decommission the vehicle and work on the high voltage side. So that's that's going to come up. There's um, Freightliner Thomas is talking about the end of the year. Also, we do detailed training with first responders. This particular slide picture actually shows Daniel doing that with Fairfax County. So we have developed a curriculum for first responders as well. So we're, you know, we're up to speed. And also, you know, we always are available for follow up questions and additional training as well. So lots of training with EV, lots of new stuff there. Um, and so we're, we're gathering best practices too as well from, from our sessions. And um, Daniel has been on site for some of the recent trainings when they or are, are uh, during the training process and then when they put the vehicle on the road to make sure the drivers are comfortable. So hopefully that answers that question. Very good. Um, I'm going to do a check in on the chat over here. We've got several questions coming in, so let's pause the popular ones and get to some of those. Um, from Nancy, we have in today's market, what is the cost of the bus battery replacement? Kaylee, want to take that one? Sure. It's a, it's not an advertised cost, um, but we can break it down. I can kind of give you estimates and. It's moving, I think, uh, as Dean said, it, it's it's going up because of a high demand for for lithium and cobalt right now. Uh, roundabout, you really have to figure what is the price per the size of the battery. And so we have a 226 kilowatt of battery on our bus. It would be in the neighborhood of $120,000 for that much power. And then you can look at one of our competitors on the state contract. We all can visit it. I'll never say anything bad about our competitors. They have a battery battery upgrade uh, selection that gets about 30% um, more than our bus. You can buy 30% more battery, but it's around $70,000 for that upgrade. So that fits into, um, it's, it's about $120,000 for um, 220. So, um, it's a lot. It's a lot. What are, what will those prices be in ten years? Is usually the next question that comes up, and and the projections are are just projections. But on the automotive batteries, we've seen those costs per kilowatt go down considerably, and the projections ten twelve years out are those batteries are going to be less than twenty five thousand dollars because of advancements similar to uh, big screen TV costs going down over a ten year period of time. And that, Kaylee, if I could add, the, the 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 batteries have an eight year standard warranty, and which is included in the price of the bus. So if you have any problems with the battery in the first eight years, it will be warranted. Yeah, and, and, and we'll get into some future 
testimonials which talk about the confidence of the battery even beyond eight years as well. Uh, another question here from Matt. Uh, how many buses are recommended per charger? Mike, you want to take take that one? Yes. Uh, you know, there's a couple of options available. You have the one on one, one to one charger to pedestal uh, that can handle up to two buses. We have a multi dispenser as well to where you could run two chargers and do up to four buses or more. So it all depends on what uh, you have to kind of coincide with the power that's available from your power company, as well as how many buses you plan on purchasing. I would add into this, you know, it depends on how many buses you're getting, what your operations looks like. That's something that certainly we could work with you one on one to decide, you know, what might best suit your specific operations. It's not necessarily what we recommend per se. Um, OK, let's see here. Uh, another one from Northampton. What is the current average state contract price for a diesel bus this year to compare it to the 375,000 for Julie? We like to say that an electric bus is approximately three times the cost of a diesel bus, but I would defer to Mike and Corey who quote diesel buses every day on what they would consider the average cost of a diesel bus in Virginia during this current buying cycle. So Mike or Corey, what would you set that at? Go ahead, Mike. You've got a you know a fair range of, of options that divisions uh, add or delete. Um, you know, by the time you add say air conditioning, uh, some other components like mobile eye and the PV360, as well as uh, integrated seats. Uh, you know, the range could be anywhere from 115 to 125, depending on what the option package is. I concur with that. All right. What is the time frame from Bill? What is the time frame on getting a new bus? I'm assuming specifically an electric school bus. I can take that one. Um, maybe some people waiting for some internal combustion engines will not like this answer because I know many of you are waiting for over 10 to 12 months for internal combustion engine. But I know at Thomas, and I can't speak for the other vendors, but at Thomas, they hold production slots for incoming electric vehicle orders. We've recently ordered some for our customers from our DEQ. Um, grants and the lead time on those buses are, is around six months. Talking to some of our partners at Thomas, they're still holding build slots for the upcoming EPA grant and trying to order the batteries ahead of time and get a hold ahead of the lead time so they can honor a six to nine month lead time. As things pick up uh, and this EPA program drives more demand, it's conceivable that that could be stretched out to a 12 month lead time. But I think they're trying to order batteries and major components ahead of time to keep within a six to 12 month lead time. And what we've seen most recently of, of, of buses ordered today or within the last two months is more like a six month lead time. All right, next question. I'm going to share this with you guys so you can see it. Um, can you provide the names of school divisions who have deployed Julie buses? So this map is a little bit dated that you're looking at here, but gives a pretty good overview of all the different localities that so far have electric school buses. I would add to this, I believe it's Campbell County, Bedford, and let's see, Amherst, Amherst Montgomery, Amherst. that would also be added to this list. So we're up to about... 19 so far that have actually received their electric buses, several others that have some on order as well. Um, next question, let's see. All right, some of these that we'll, we'll put them along with some of our popular questions here, but uh, how does the fuel cost compare to a traditional diesel bus? Kaylee, you want to take that one? We have a graph here for that, and and this is all uh, dependent on on the inputs you have. What are you getting for fuel efficiency right now? 
on a diesel bus, how many miles are you accumulating, and what your electrical bill is, and what what you're paying for for diesel. Uh, we're we're seeing right now with the high cost of diesel, basically a 75 percent reduction in, in fueling costs, and uh, that depends on your efficiency as well. So we talked about range before. This efficiency isn't one that gets thrown out. It's a very conservative efficiency of 1.7 kilowatt hours of energy consumed for every mile driven. The more you drive that down, you make it 1.4, 1.2 we've seen in some cases, the greater your efficiency is gonna be and the more savings you're going to, to see. So it depends on your driving habits. That 1.7 is a very conservative number. We're seeing in many cases with regenerative braking, adding charge back to the battery, we're able to beat that 1.7, but this is kind of a conservative estimate that that we've observed. What about charge times too, Kayla? You know, that's having an impact as well, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, we, we said that for a good point, Corey, the first the first year in operations, those, those districts that, that Whitney showed before, we collectively, you know, formed a partnership. And our partnership, our our purpose was to keep those buses moving, just keep the wheels going round and round. And we get back and and during midday at a district, let's plug it in. It's at sixty percent. Let's get it back up to a hundred percent, just because that felt safe to get that charge back there. And I think what we we want to do with our partners going forward is we want to be smarter about when we're charging. If it's at 60%, drive it in the afternoon, let it get to 20%. Let's charge in the evening when we're not having to pay peak rates at around 11 cents per kilowatt hour, and we can buy electricity from the utilities at six cents per hour. And with that will come smarter charging and, and drive those rates down. But this is this has been our experience so far through smarter charging and, and really knowing how our utility bills work we think we can drive that 11 cents a kilowatt hour down into single digits and increase the savings even more. Thanks for pointing that out, Corey. Jumping to our next question, what is the expected life cycle of an electric school bus? And I will take that one. So short answer, we expect 12 to 15 years. We expect it to go for the normal, you know, length of what you would expect a school bus to go for traditionally. Um, what we can say in terms of actual experience of that are two things. One, so we've had many of these Julie buses, 50 plus, 50-ish of them now, driving for a full school year. And in that last year of operation, going full routes of a school bus, we've seen less than a 1% degradation on the battery. So from what we're seeing in actual real world experience so far, we believe this 12, 15 years to certainly come to fruition. We will see what we're saying here in 10 to so years, but based on the actual data that we have seen in operation so far, we expect that to be the case. Um, a second point to that is the same battery technology that is used in the Julie electric school bus has been used in Proterra transit buses like you see here for about eight to 10 years now. And certainly the duty cycle of a transit bus is quite a bit more robust uh, than that of a school bus. So they have had these batteries lasting for the length of their uh, transit buses. So certainly we would think that for at least the same in a school bus application. So um, hopefully that answers your question. I think we had someone ask about that um, earlier in the chat, but another question about battery health that we received is what kind of impact does this constant charging have on the electric bus and its battery? So again, I would revert back to in the last year, like Kaylee mentioned, the charging has probably been even more extensive than it needed to be where, you know, we've charged midday, we've charged at night. So again, more on the extensive end of what was perhaps necessary and what we've seen in terms of battery degradation over the last year is again less than one percent so don't expect that to significantly reduce it and certainly the battery has um, a ba battery management software system built into it that kind of helps mitigate um, what you know charging discharging if you were to use v to g that kind of helps to offset what that impacts the battery so Unless there's any follow up on that. How does the maintenance of an electric school bus compare to a traditional bus? 
Mike, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, basically, everybody understands, you know, tire work, brake work, seat work, glass work, uh, various components like that are, are normal on a school bus. The the reduced maintenance side that we see, which is 50% less on the electric bus, has to do with the battery desiccant replacement, the transmission gearbox fluid, air compressor fluid and filter, and power steering uh, pump fluid. So those are all the only items that you will have uh, for the maintenance of the EV bus. Now, you're eliminating belts, you're eliminating oil filters for the engine, engine oil, uh, other components, water pumps, uh, various things like that. So that's why you will see a 50% savings on operating the EV bus. Follow up question to that. Oh, Kaylee, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add on a couple things. Um, another another savings from a maintenance standpoint is is brake pads. Um, we I mentioned regenerative braking, but when when you drive the bus, if you drive it in the right mode of transportation on a school route, uh, you can quote unquote in the EV forums get uh, one foot driving, meaning you only have to be on the accelerator because when you let off the accelerator, the bus starts to slow down. It pumps electricity from the motor back into the battery and it really does decelerate. And uh, it is certainly feasible to cut your brake use down by 80 percent. It's it's that aggressive and it, it's almost that fun when you drive. For me, it's it's almost like a contest in my head. Can I make this thing stop safely, not impede traffic without touching that brake pad at all? In, in many instances, you, you can do that. Um, I also want to play devil's advocate a little bit with, Mike certainly went through the maintenance, and um, then besides the maintenance, what breaks, right? Aren't you <laughs> replacing batteries all the time, and, and don't you have other things that you just have to replace? Well, our first year hasn't been perfect. Our first full of school year hasn't been perfect. Um, we had new things, new components we learned about, and things did break, and we'd have to repair it. Um, we started the year with our, the fleet of 50 being operating 90% of the time, and we found a few chronic issues right out of the factory that was new that we had to fix, uh, but those are fixed. Those are on the buses. The newer buses have those improvements in them, and now the fleet operate the full end of the school year, and around 98% of the buses were, were up all at one time. And I would take those numbers and compare them to the diesel. Um, certainly the new shiny ball electric we want running all the time. It gets a lot more attention and uh, people expect it to run more, but I can tell you it, the uptime is higher than that of a one year old diesel bus. And, and we're proud of that, but we've had to learn that kind of the hard way of what breaks and what needs to be fixed back at the factory. So the overall, Besides the maintenance, the overall uptime, um, really the last half of this school year has been pretty phenomenal on the buses. Follow-up question to that from Northampton County. Uh, what are the differences on the chassis between an electric bus and a diesel bus? Any volunteers for that one? I'll, Daily, I'll, Mike, go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead and make a stab at it, and my team can follow up if I miss anything. But uh, basically, the chassis of the school bus is the same as the current C2 in production for diesel. Uh, what you're going to see different is actual components that are attached to the frame. Uh, you know, your battery pack, your inverter, the electric motor, uh, the two-speed transmission, the drive shaft. Uh, those are the additional components. Uh, you have some uh, high voltage junction box that has the connections in it underneath the hood. We have a cooling module. We have, you know, it's a different AC compressor for air conditioning versus the belt driven one. Now it's electric motor driven. Uh, same way on the compressor for the bus body. Uh, we have a chiller on the AC system for the chassis. That's additional. Uh, those batteries have to stay between 78 and 72 and 68 degrees. So we have a chiller for the summer and we have a grid heater for the winter. 
to maintain that temperatures. So you've got di different components. However, the chassis of the bus is the same. Good job, Mike. Indeed. All right, next one. Um, what bus and charger funding is available? Um, I will take that one. So certainly like Dean was mentioning earlier, that 375 price tag that not a single person in the state of Virginia has paid that price tag because there is so many different funding opportunities available to school districts to make that possible. A couple of the current ones going on, um, of course, there is the EPA Clean School Bus Rebate Program. So that's the one that you've likely heard a lot of buzz about recently. That program is part of the $5 billion Clean School Bus Program that was instituted by the um, infrastructure law. Uh, the $5 billion program itself goes over a five-year period from 2022 to 2026. And in this first stage that we are, we are in, the rebate program just opened up in May. And like I said, this is the very first uh, release of part of that money from the $5 billion bucket, if you will. Um, opened up on May 22nd, I believe it was, and the application period closes <laughs> August 19th. So that's the one that you hear a lot of buzz about right now. Um, as far as how much funding is available through that program. So applicants are kind of split into two groups by the EPA, and that is by a priority versus non-priority status. Um, for priority school districts, you could be eligible for $375,000 for an electric school bus and $20,000 for a charger. To add a little bit of clarity onto that, a common question we get about that specific funding, is it $20,000 for one charger for all the buses, or is it per bus? And it is per bus. So for every bus you get, you're also given $20,000 for a charger to support that bus. So $375 and $20,000 for priority. For non-priority school districts, it looks more like $250,000 for the bus and $13,000 for the charger. Um, that is a lottery rebate program. Everyone is encouraged to apply, even if you are a non-priority school district. Um, there is a possibility right now the program has 500 million um, allocated to it, but it is quite possible that additional money could be added to it. Um, the way the $5 billion bucket works is they're supposed to spend $1 billion a year, and here we are in July, and so far only one program has been released. So in theory, there's another $500 million that could potentially be spent this year, could be put into a new program, could be rolled over into the next year, or if there is enough demand through this rebate program, they could choose to add additional funding to it. So it is certainly worth applying, whether a priority or non-priority. A uh, follow-up question from Matt on that. How do you determine if you are a priority school district? So the EPA assigns priority versus non-priority. They do have a published list on their website. Be glad to send you a link for that. Uh, the way that they kind of delegate that status is based on if you are a rural school district, um, and or a high need, low income school district. So several different qualifications there. I believe in Virginia, it's somewhere to the tune of maybe 70 school districts or so that are considered priority school districts. So quite possible that, you know, some of you individuals are on here that could be priority status. Um, another program that you might have heard of is the Dominion Energy Electric School Bus Program. So very possible you've heard about it in the last few years, the first part of the program paid for those 50, 50, first 50 buses. And now the program has been modified to help support charging infrastructure for maybe those that are applying through the rebate program and get awarded funding. Dominion, if you're in their territory and putting a charger in part of their service territory, will work with school divisions on a participation agreement to potentially get additional funding for extended warranties as well as charging infrastructure at their facility. Feel free, anybody can jump in and add on to what I'm, I'm saying, but other options are subscription model programs. You might have heard of Highland Electric, a couple other different, um, again, what we mentioned is kind of creative financing programs, especially for those that are wanting to do large scale. There are some options there. Um, 
Other potential options through utility programs, if maybe you're not in Dominion's footprint, certainly American Power also had a program, a certain amount of money that they made available for school districts. So there are lots of different funding avenues, and that's something that, you know, again, Corey and Mike can work with you individually to see, you know, based on where you're located, what you're looking to do as, as far as how many buses you want, they can kind of steer you in the right direction as to which program may work best for you. So. Hey, Whitney, Anybody want to add anything to like, that? I'd like to add that Sam ID uh, tip on, you know, on applying for the uh, EPA grant. Uh, once you go into the application process, you will have to identify your Sam ID number into the application. That application is going to see who the email is addressed to for the Sam ID for your local division. Uh, if you try to put it in with your email address and not the Sam ID attached email address, it will not accept it. So whoever created the Sam ID account for your division you need to go in through that email address. Further on the EPA, we got two other questions. One about actually finding the application. So the website for the EPA, and I will put this in the chat here if anybody wants it there, um, is just epa.gov slash clean school bus. To actually get to the application, you just click here. Gonna click over here. And then when you're ready to actually go to the application, you click there. Now it's gonna take you to this. What do you do if the person who created a, uh, an account some time ago is no longer with the school division? Most of the divisions we've encountered has another person that has the Sam ID email. So yeah. you just yeah, got to make sure it's the active email attached to the Sam ID account number. There are four point of contacts that can access it. So there should be multiple individuals. And if it Furthermore, if this application, which is due by August 19th, and you decide on August 12th to, that your district's going to apply and you're really having problems with that SAM account, call Sonny Merriman and let us apply for you because we have a SAM account and we can do your district and apply for you. We prefer that each division district applies on its own, but we're, we're saving that for you. In the worst case, when we're down to the wire, we can apply for you as well. When you click that final link here, this is actually where it's going to take you to that SAM login, um, and it won't let you even get into the application without having the SAM ID. So um, as far as where to find out if you're a priority school district, there are some links on here. Like I said, I can send it to you. you got to find the specific place that actually has, oh, believe it's here. So going back to this link here. Um, I'll put that in the chat for you. Priority school districts are right down here in supporting materials. You can download a PDF of it here, which is also in the chat now, or you can download the Excel document to see if your school district is on that list. And again, we can help you identify that too if you want some help with that. So, all right. Let's see here. So we'll jump back into the chat and see what questions we have here still. Um, Whitney, I'll take the one at Northampton. Uh, the no changes to leg room or seating capacity. No, okay. there is no uh, capacity changes uh, on seating. And except right now, uh, our capacity on the EV bus is at either 65 passenger, 71 passenger, or 77 passenger. So and we, we will not have we will not have a sped unit, a 53 passenger sped unit until 2024. In the, in the next phase of, of our development. I'll take the question from Brett from Charlotte County. Um, what are the costs for training current mechanics and how long is the training? Um, there is no cost. That's all included, Brett. And the uh, the training typically takes anywhere from a day to two days. Um, and it, we just, you know, we're there as long as we need to be to make sure everybody's comfortable with the vehicles. So we we some days, sometimes we're there a little bit longer, sometimes we're there a little bit less. The uh, 
he, you also put a question in there, what are the effects of the camera systems on, on the charge of the battery? That's all on the low voltage side. So it, that, that doesn't have anything to do with the, um, the actual battery itself. So you're, you're good there as well. And if I may add, the training also includes <clears throat> technicians, drivers, and first responders. If your locality first responders are interested in and knowing a little bit about this vehicle, if they encounter it in a in an incident. I think everyone can tell that we definitely stress training and the importance of it. I think there's a quote that says, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go together. And that is very much how we see training um, to make this a successful implementation. We have realized in the last year how important training is just to get, you know, if nothing else, just to increase the confidence and comfortable, uh, how comfortable a driver is and how comfortable a technician is with, you know, laying hands on the buses. And, um, you know, we have done the standard training as far as classroom hands on format, but we've even also went out and said, you know, is follow up training needing just to get that additional level of comfort? You know, do you need us to come back and maybe go on a one day's route with a driver just to kind of see their day to day experience and provide some feedback? Because uh, I was looking with the school district earlier this week of looking at some data from when they first got their buses um, back actually at the end of the 2020 21 school year, looking at kind of their efficiency they were getting back then versus now what kind of efficiency that they're getting with their buses you can you can see over the last year as their drivers have gotten more comfortable with it and practice some of those um, specific EV driving techniques that their efficiency has improved greatly because they're starting to use more of that one pedal driving that Kaylee mentioned and that kind of thing so that's where training is absolutely crucial to successfully implementing these buses into your fleet. Uh, another question here from Northampton. Does the 20,000 per bus fully fund the cost of an efficient charging setup? Uh, if anybody wants to take it, if not, I can take a stab at it. Um, $20,000. So right now on the state contract, the 25 kilowatt charger, yes, it could cover the cost of that one. But if you were to want an actual fast charger that again, it gets you that more of that two to three our um, charge, no $20,000 would not cover it. Uh, that is where programs like Dominion's comes into play, especially and works to the benefit of school districts to help offset the cost of the higher powered chargers. So, Whitney, let me that. add to that. Uh, I don't know who the power supplier is in Northampton. I don't know if you have Dominion or it's a co-op. Uh, but you may want to post that map to show the, uh, the coverages. I would work with my local power company on uh, and co-op to see if uh, they will work out some type of, of funding or or support for the chargers. Mike, the Eastern Shore is A and N. Okay. Okay. So I want to add to that too as well because I know Matt asked a question about how many um, chargers per bus. And, you know, Matt, me and you talked yesterday or the day before you guys are in uh, Dominion's footprint. So what Dominion's been doing on their charger participation agreement is, is it depends, but basically it, it, at a minimum two to one, some of them have been one to one on the fast chargers. So um, that's how they, they've been setting up their charger, if that answers your question. I, I, see. I think we can even throw even more specifics. The, the crowd is hungry for the specifics. So if you, if you got two buses, that that would give you forty thousand dollars for for charging. And certainly the the smaller chargers can be covered. If you look at our state contract, uh, there's different versions out there of multi dispensers. Uh, you can get a, a non V to G multi dispenser. Let's just say in the neighborhood of $50,000. So now you may have around $10,000 out of pocket. If you want to get that V to G one, which certainly our partners at Dominion are are interested in, and, and you want one charger with, with two cables coming off from it so you can charge two buses, it's closer to $70,000. So now you have a $30,000 Delta. But if, 
if you have Dominion as a partner, they're going to come in and, and help pick up on that one. So those are a few just specific numbers for you in your planning. May I add one more fact? Uh, in the in the event a division runs into a shortage of, of budget money, there are financial uh, programs available that we can uh, through like Daimler Truck Financial that can uh, offer support in financing the uh, whatever you need. Let's see. Checking back through the chat. I think we've answered all the questions so far. If I'm missing one, please just copy paste and send it in again, but I'm looking through. Oh, we did miss one, Matt. Um, how much is the extended warranty on batteries? So um, Floyd mentioned that the batteries come with a standard eight year warranty. Again, that comes with the bus itself. Um, on state contract, I mean, any of these prices, the bus price, the charger price, the warranty price, they are all listed on our state contract for reference. Um, we have a couple extended warranty options, one of which is a 10 year extended warranty and another is a 12 year extended warranty and they run between 11,000 and about $15,000. Uh, does the constant charging when not needed affect battery life? Um, anybody want to take that one? I know I answered a little bit about charging, but just to get someone different, Corey, Kaylee. Sure, the Darlena, you you had addressed that a little bit, um, Whitney earlier about battery debt. You know, um, the one percent degradation over the year. But basically, what ha all that's managed, Darlene, you, you don't have a constant charge on the battery. The charge will shut off at a certain percentage, and it actually trickles to at a certain percentage to protect the battery. All that's engineered into the, in, into the entire charger bus handshake. So you don't have to worry about it constantly charging your bus and, you know, overheating your battery and causing damage to your battery all that's managed in the, in the engineering part of that process other questions from anyone i think we're all caught up in the chat okay got a few more minutes left if anybody wants to think on it if not, I'm going to go ahead and throw this slide up here. It's certainly, oops, uh, exit out of it. Oh, certainly giving you a lot to kind of look at and consider here. And I'm sure probably other questions will come up as you think on what all the different things that we've discussed as you drew in your own research. And we are here to help answer those questions. Um, if you have other questions, I've put an email address there that actually will go to all of our team members and someone will reach back out to you to either set up a meeting or answer your specific questions. We're glad to be here to help. Um, in addition to that, I would also throw in that we recently got a Sonny Merriman Julie bus that we are eager to show you and uh, bring to your school division. If you want to actually lay your own eyes on it, lay your hands on it, put it in the shop, put it up on a lift, whatever you want to do, maybe test drive it a little bit. I know Corey and Mike would love to bring it to you to check it out personally. So um, one other question, is there anything special that needs to be done if a bus has to be towed in or is it just like a diesel bus? I'll take that, uh, Whitney. Uh, Matt, basically it's just about the same procedure. If it's an air brake bus, you have to cage your rear parking brakes and slip the drive shaft loose and most of the towing companies will have a strap that attaches the drive shaft to the frame to hold it out of the way so that's the only two things you need to do but please we recommend not to tow the bus without the drive shaft uh, slipped out of the rear end all right one more question and i'm going to pull this up so you can see it as i talk along with it so Question is, to get this funding, the EPA rebate funding, are we required to take a diesel bus off the road? Um, yes, this program does require that you take one bus out of commission, if you will. 
um, which we have heard from many smaller fleets, um, especially that happens to align with many that are actually priority school districts that they just feel like they don't have a bus that can be taken out of commission and they're a little bit apprehensive about taking a bus out and then getting a new electric bus that they're not yet familiar with and don't yet feel comfortable with just absolutely swapping it out with one of their existing buses. Uh, the good news is, is that the EPA program, when they were making this program, they, they certainly did take that into consideration from feedback that they got from school districts. And they actually give you quite a long period of time to be able to get familiar with your new bus before you actually have to get rid of your old bus. So I pulled up here and I'll put this also in the chat that um, the EPA program timeline actually extends all the way into October 2024. So you see there that you you don't have to have that bus decommissioned until about that October 2024 time frame. Um, a bus that you have to take out, do you have one that is old enough? It has to be a 2010 model bus or older. Um, if you do not have a 2010, if you're looking at a 2011 or newer, and they do give you an option for that where you can take that 2011 or newer bus and actually sell or donate it. And that would also qualify as a um, possible option for you. So let me add to that, Whitney. Uh, in the once you determine what your buses, diesel buses will be coming off the road, we will actually do the decommission for you document it. Uh, we drill the hole in the block as well as uh, have the information that we will send back to you so you can submit it to the EPA grant. But but the nice thing is you can't sell these buses so that that's a new option that. But I would also add to Whitney that this program is probably the best program that's been out there when you compare them to the EPA or the uh, DEQ money and AEP and even the Dominion program that this particular program that we're in now, this window with the EPA is um, by far the best program out there um, for you guys to get into EVs. And especially, uh, so, especially if you're a priority school district. Exactly. If, if you meet that criteria, if you're non-priority, you know, you're going to have to pay what the cost of the diesel a bus it is and then they will pretty much that 250 is to try to take care of the electrifying that bus. Yeah, I see a question too from Northampton on all these are the EV buses vetted. And I would say in speaking to for our product. Our the product has been vetted. We have vehicles that have been out there on the road for almost two years. So we're very confident that if you would have asked us two years ago, our confidence level may not have been as high as where it's at now because we have we we have a lot of experience, not limited experience. So we're pretty excited about Julie and how it's been performing. So well, the, the, let me say this, the 50 buses we have on the road today or 50 plus buses, you know, approaching a half a million miles of service. And the Proterra batteries that we utilize and the Proterra drivetrain um, has been out there for about eight years on their transit buses and have accumulated 15 million miles. So um, are there some are there some 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 issues? Yes, but for the most part, I mean this bus runs every day. Um, and like Kaylee said earlier, the uh, we we really think that the uptime on an electric bus is better than a diesel. Um, jumping back to the EPA program, uh, once we conclude, I will send out this flyer for everybody on here. Just if you want to see a little bit more information about the EPA program going on. Um, also, another question here from Matt. At the end of the EV bus's life cycle, can it be sold or must it be crushed, recycled? Kaylee, want to take that one? Mute it. Thank you, Whitney. Matt, there, there's definitely going to be new businesses evolve and utilities that are going to be interested in buying those batteries at the end of the life cycle. When they're done, you decide when they're done, but typically we say when 15 years from now, when the 
Battery only has 70% of the original power that it has today, and that's kind of what we're projecting. It'll have 70% of the original power. That's very valuable still pockets of energy for utilities to use for renewables. Um, there'll be other business cases we think that come up that will make those great storage devices for small communities, small buildings, generator applications. So there'll be business models which will make those batteries attractive 15 years from now. In fact, the utilities are already expressing their interest today. Hey, Taylor, could you add about the throughputs and all on the 226 kilowatt battery for the BDG? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, you're more you're more clear on that than I am. Yeah, so so a lot of customers will want to use the the batteries for V2G with their local utilities, and um, it even gets to some of Darlene's question. The battery is judged not on miles, but throughput. You know how many chart electrons are going in and out over the lifetime, and the extended warranty that's offered by Proterra gives more than enough miles and enough V to G sessions like 30 or 40 a summer to do V to G and drive 12 to 15,000 miles and have the throughput both discharging and charging up to make it make it a long, long time. So we, we change our mentality a little bit to think about throughput instead of miles on these batteries and uh, the range that Proterra has seen on their buses as well as offered in their extended warranty far exceeds what we as consumers in a school district, even doing some V2G testing, would ever tax these batteries with. Another question here, and I'll just throw this up there as part of it to answer it. So uh, from Lee, uh, I noticed on the units on display at the VAP VAPT conference that the battery containment area extends below the frame of the vehicle. Do you see this as a concern on uneven ground? Is there a concern with the possibility of compromising the battery pack? Um, certainly, that's a question that we have received before um, as far as the batteries being exposed. Is there an issue with you know, possibly damaging those battery packs? They do go through quite the rigorous testing. The, the pack itself is ballistic grade material and casing uh, for further protection on it. But just to show you a quick video of Hopefully you guys can see this play here. Just some of the testing that is done for this battery pack there. So hopefully it's playing okay. Yes, no. So you can't hear the sound on it again. This is on the Proterra website, just doing some testing. I know there, you can see there, they're dropping a manhole cover on it. Specifically there, um, some immersion testing here for water testing in general, but that was a concern specifically for New York City school buses. Part of their specs requires that the possibility of a manhole exploding underneath the bus and would the battery packs be safe and unharmed from it. So that's part of where that testing came from, from Proterra to specifically make sure the battery would be fine in that case. And as you can see, not a bit of damage done to the battery pack. So. And that, that addresses that skinny portion that Lee saw underneath the frame rail. A majority is still within the frame rail. Uh, and I know Daimler ran multiple, didn't have to, but did a high speed side impact tests on their fleet and uh, absolutely no damage to the battery. Frame rail, bus body absorbed everything and created a great cocoon around the battery pack. And, and they have the testing to, to back that up. It was an expensive test. Follow up question here or a different question. Will the EV be an option for Minotaurs in the future? I think Floyd, you mentioned about that earlier or no, that was the sped bus. Who wants to take that one? I'll take uh, it. Yeah, yes, there are plans for a type A electric bus. Probably be, uh, that's probably still a couple of years out. And Matt, I sure hope you'll still be around to buy one. <laughs> Um, it's 11.35. I know I want to be aware of everyone's time. We're glad, for again, to stay on and answer some questions, but we certainly understand if anybody has to get off. I have a recording of this and would be glad to send it out. 
Um, and I will also send you a flyer. And again, certainly if you have other questions, you can reach out to our team specifically and we'll be glad to set up another call or, or whatever we need to do to answer those questions. We certainly can't avoid one of these questions. Have any Which Julie's caught fire? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, are we able to control access to the charging stations if our bus lot is not secured? Do they require a key or code to use? I don't believe there is Kay or Kaylee, Corey, Mike, anybody, Floyd, have any further? Maybe I can help out on this. Uh, you know, if you have an unsecured lot, the charger does have a handle on it that can be turned off and locked with a lock just in case, uh, you know, you're worried about vandalism or somebody using it. Uh, I would think about talking to maintenance or operations and try to get a, a fence and a gate put around that those chargers if possible, but uh, there's no specific key on the Proterra and the Rhombus. However, on the Delta charger, there's an actual little credit card that activates the system. So you have to have that to be able to charge the bus. Every charger is a little bit different, uh, but most of the chargers, and I think we'll see evolution um, as as time goes on, most of the chargers that we use, we have a way of seeing them being used via our laptop, some remote diagnostics. And so if something's being used, in addition to what Mike is saying, with some physical controls, you can electronically at your laptop. In most applications, there's an app for the charger and you can say, huh, it's on or uh, it shouldn't be on, or thank goodness that bus is already at 90%. So there's some, controls electronically around the chargers too, depending on the ones you purchase. We have several of these school districts that have operated these buses for the past year that that have chargers at their schools and they are not they are not secured um, by any kind of fencing or anything. And I, I don't I, I have not heard of anybody having any issue with vandalism of the chargers. We have not. That's correct. Other questions? I think we're caught up in the chat. All right. Well, we certainly appreciate everybody getting on this morning. Uh, had a nice group of people and enjoyed talking with you about it. As I've got the slide up here, if you have any further questions, you can email Julie at sunnymerriman.com or if you certainly have any of the any of our personal contact information, you can email us individually as well. But uh, Kaylee, if you have any closing remarks or Floyd. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a run at it and then hand it off to Floyd. Uh, our recommendation is go apply, get a $400,000 set of value for zero to 25 to $50,000. It's, it's fun. Your drivers will love doing it. It's a, really a heck of an opportunity with the EPA. And then we at Sunny Merriman have, have experience. Uh, it's not going to be a perfect experience for you. Um, but it's a fun one and, and one that I think you guys could be proud of. So we really re recommend you seize the opportunity and we're here to stand behind you when you do. Floyd? I'll just second that, you know, Kaylee, absolutely. Um, you know, with the pricing of the buses now, most of you are going to have some sort of out-of-pocket uh, uh, expenditure. But, you know, if that bus comes in at $400,000, let's say, and, and with air conditioning, and it's going to be close to that with air conditioning. Most everybody's buying air conditioning now. Um, if that bus comes in at four hundred thousand dollars, you know, for twenty five thousand dollars of school board money, you're getting a four hundred thousand dollar asset. I mean, that's that's a pretty good deal if you're if you're if you're a priority. And of course, if you're non priority, you're looking at you know one hundred and fifty thousand, which most of you. Uh, that are non-priority, you're, you're, you're more urban uh, or, or, or uh, the, the larger school districts in Northern Virginia and their buses are in that, you know, between 125 and $150,000 now anyway. So they would just be paying for this bus what they're paying for an electric bus itself. And it's the future, That's, this is where we're headed. There's no question in my mind that, that um, 
you know, we, we talk about diesel, we talk about propane, we talk about natural gas, but they're still all uh, uh, internal combustion engines and those products will not be around in, in 20 to, to, to 30 years, I can assure you of that. All right, thank you all for joining. Appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, thank you for attending. Thanks everybody.